Hey, this is Dominic, and this is your home for the cutting edge conversations on optimizing your personal performance, lighting up your sex life, and living a purpose driven life of your own design. These are the topics that Dominic and I have both struggled with in our own lives and still don't always get right. This is Brian. Welcome to the Great Man Podcast. Brian and I had an absolute blast recording this episode for you about 10 of the biggest lessons that we've learned after the recording of the first 250 episodes of this podcast. It's almost unbelievable to say that we've had 250 episodes in the first two and a half years, but here we are and we're dropping the biggest dimes on you today. And as we go through each of those episodes, just know that in the show notes, all of those episodes that we reference will be linked. I also want to give you a heads up that in the show notes, I've linked four new Spotify playlists that we've created. Number one is the new listeners start here list. So we put together a list of 10 episodes that if you're a new listener, if you want to send this to a friend, these are the 10 episodes that we recommend getting your feet wet with. There's also the top 10 most downloaded episodes that we've put into a Spotify playlist, the top 10 episodes on masculinity, and then also our mastermind member interview episodes. So a number of the men from the Great Men Masterminds have come on this podcast to share their stories. We've taken all of those episodes and created a Spotify playlist All four of those playlists are linked in the show notes. Enjoy today's episode of the biggest lessons we've learned from our first 250 episodes. Well, buddy, you've had yourself an eventful last week, week and a half. Let us count the ways we were in the Colorado Rockies together for our annual trip with our men's group. You came back. It was your birthday. You went to Atlantic City with the woman that you love. You saw a fish concert and also your business with Vahila and the COVID testing company, which was winding down, is now exploding again. How have you kept your head straight these last seven or eight days, man? <laughs> it was really easy in Colorado because I couldn't breathe. So that <laughs> the altitude is a thing. I kind of thought like, you know, I've heard of it. I'm like, yeah, of course. Like it's a little harder to breathe in altitude. But man, I was like the first night. I laid down. I typically sleep like a baby. I've got really good sleep skills, if you will. But man, that first night, I woke up. It felt like every time I tried to take a breath. Yeah. That took it out of me there for about a day. But after we sprinted around for what felt like eight straight hours on the disc golf course, yep. <laughs> I had really, really kicked it into gear. So I think I'm glad we started that way because I haven't sprinted in a long time. <laughs> How are the hamstrings after that, man? Yeah, there's the, the hips, the hamstrings. You know, my my young age of 40 had really hit me. And now I'm 41. So I had, I had an absolutely epic birthday when I got back. And I feel like now I'm back in the saddle uh, at work while COVID's going bananas, which is awful for the world, good for business. But it's crazy, man. Like a lot of clients that we fully anticipated winding down the business. And now we're having clients come back and ask all kinds of new questions again, because I'm not sure if people listening to this are feeling this at all. But what we thought was complicated before and how do we deal with testing and how do we deal with vaccines and timing and quarantine times and everything else is all up in the air again, because we have vaccines. Maybe you take it, maybe you don't take it. We have Delta variant. What does that mean in terms of timeline? So like all the questions that we are answering for the last almost year and a half are all up in the air again. So it's been a wild, wild couple of weeks. Yeah, man. And we're approaching another autumn season, which we saw last year. Like we were winding things down, we were stabilizing and then autumn hit and then everything exploded and we went back into new lockdown procedures and protocols. I mean, what are we based on a guy who sees from the mountaintop on which he stands, is there anything that you can let us know what to prepare for? I won't give it away what we're doing in this podcast, but I was looking through some of our old podcasts and we did one called Fortify Your Foundation right at the beginning. I think it was like March 12th or something like that. Yep. Right at the beginning of the pandemic and dangerous to make predictions on recording, but I am more pessimistic about this situation than I have been ever. Really? Pessimistic about what? The outlook of this coming to an end. Anytime soon or ever? <laughs> definitely anytime soon. I don't. I can't say ever, but definitely anytime soon. And I and I mean not not just a couple of years. The reason being is 
there's something called a transmission. And usually respiratory viruses have a transmission of one or two per year. And that's where they, they it's called gain of function, where they become more contagious. They could become more um, deadly, let's say. And usually viruses like this have one to two transmissions a year. The coronavirus has already had 17. So that means that it's, it's mutating really, really quickly and, and no surprise, right? It's a global pandemic. So what that means is if a virus mutates to the level where it escapes the current vaccine, it will take a minimum of 100 days for a Pfizer, for a Moderna to create, just to create the new vaccine. And then we got to distribute it worldwide again. In that time period, we have to hope we can create it, manufacture it, distribute it, and that people take it all before a new mutation oh, is created. right. Because it could become irrelevant as soon as a new mutation. Yeah. Exactly. So that's that's why I'm feeling pessimistic about this. Now, you know, we'll, we'll do what we've always done and adjust and, and look at science and look at numbers and, and hopefully our behavior changes a little bit as a world society. But that's why I'm pessimistic right now. So... Um, We'll see. We'll see what happens. Well, if that ain't a way to warm up our audience <laughs> to, 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 to conversation. That, that it's we're, all going to burn. <laughs> it's just, don't even bother listening to this episode. You're not going to be around next year. <laughs> we talked about this before about how like, you know, you, you said that one of the things you wanted to work on was being like too agreeable. Right. And so we were, we were talking about one time having a segment where Brian disagrees. And so like we take on some of our guests who come on and share their perspectives and you're like, I disagree. <laughs> and you're also a very optimistic guy. So I suppose this was our first foray into Brian ain't so optimistic. That's right. I'm, I feel like I'm more, re more realistic on this one, just, just based on what the numbers, right? Just based on the science and what we're looking at. Unfortunately, that's where we're at. That's the reality. Yeah, I mean, I mean listen, and I, pr I appreciate that and I, I trust you. You've been a great source of information all throughout this process as, as I've been navigating this. So hopefully our, our listeners appreciate what they just heard from you as well, even if, they don't, even if it's a tougher pill to swallow than most. One of the things that I just mentioned about how fast you and I have been moving in our lives or how fast like the last week of your life has been is that we recently hit a milestone in our podcast with hitting over 250 episodes. And because like our lives have been moving so quickly, we didn't really have a chance to celebrate that and really look back at all the things that we've learned. And I know that when people come to me, listeners of our show, they'll say, man, you've had a chance to interview some really cool guests. You've explored some really powerful topics. Like you've been running the show for two and a half years now. What have you learned? You know, what stands out to you? And so we thought that this would be a really cool opportunity for us to sit down and hit some of the high points, lessons that we've learned over the last 250 episodes. And by no means is this a thorough and searching inventory of everything, but these were 10 of the lessons that stood out for us as we did our first sweep. We could easily do like five more of these episodes and still not cover all of the lessons that we've learned. Why don't I... Start with you, my friend. Is there a particular lesson or something that you've learned from our first 250 episodes that you'd like to toss in the ring first? This is one of the reasons I love doing this episode. I'm, I'm both an extrovert, which means I learn when speaking out loud, and I learn my best medium for learning is auditory. So doing a podcast is a perfect fit, and that's what I love. I love learning some of these things. So this was a really easy task for me. I'm going to go chronologically. That's the order I'm going in here. And there's a funny story behind this one. So there's a couple episodes we did in early 2019 on routines, on morning routines, on nighttime routines. When Becca and I first started dating, she was living in D.C. I was living in New York. She came to visit me and stay at my place for the first time. She was also under a ridiculous deadline for work. And so when she got there, when she got to New York, she came into Union Station, not Union Station, Grand Central Station, and said, hey, look, I'm here. I'm excited to be here, but I don't have a ton of time tonight. Can we do dinner quickly so we can get back to your place and I can do some work? I said, no problem. I've already got a reservation. Let's go there now and we'll get moving. The dinner took too long. There wasn't time to, for dessert, which everybody knows that I love. And so I said, Becca, no problem. I'm going to have dessert ordered to our place so that you can work. I can do my thing. I'll leave you alone and we'll go from there. And she said, God, like that is so sweet. It's so sweet of you to do that. And so I ordered cookies and I, I didn't order two. I ordered like a dozen cookies. From where? It was a small bakery called Swoop or something like that in Williamsburg. And <laughs> they were big cookies. 
so she, I, I go, look, like here's here's your cornucopia of cookies. What, what flavor would you like? And she takes, you know, one of them. She's like, this is very nice. And then I go in my bed. I'm on my computer and I'm eating my cookies. And at some point she looked over at me and she was like, you look really comfortable. I just like, maybe you've done this before. And I just kind of waved it off. Then our podcast came out on nighttime routines and she listened to it in, in DC maybe a week later. And she's like, and that was my morning. That was one of my nighttime routines is I would order cookies, <laughs> and eat them before I went to bed. With your laptop in your in your lap and with crumbs yes. all over the bed. Yes. I this had this. nothing to do with her and it was not because I was a nice guy. It's because that was my nighttime routine. <laughs> and so I remember, I remember her getting a hold of me and being like, you dick. You said, <laughs> I thought you were doing this for me, but you do this every freaking night. Yeah, you pass this off as chivalrous, and it was That's just basically right. you were just folding her into your typical into the, my my evil my evil ways. Yes, yeah. so big thing for me, and something I bounced around back and forth on nighttime routines and morning routines, and those were episodes uh, thirteen and thirty. Thirteen was the morning routine, thirty was the nighttime routine. But man, I can tell a difference when I am sticking to my nighttime routine first. I get up and I'm much more likely to hit my morning routine and my days and weeks and months just become way more productive and happier. And I notice it after two days of not doing that. That's when I start to notice a dip. That's really good, man. I definitely remember on the podcast talking about that and like, you're just like, yeah, I've kind of taken food into bed every single night. I get the crumbs that are lying around, littered around me. And then I wake up feeling like crap and then I have to do crappy things in the morning to like get me out of that. And and it becomes this like nasty cycle. So I'm glad that we hit those topics early, 200 plus episodes ago. So you have two years to upgrade. Well done. That's right. And also, Becca, good job by you for calling out Brian on his bullshit. <laughs> yes, chivalrous man. Okay. One of mine came from one of our very first episodes as well. And uh, the headline is, here's the lesson that I learned. When it comes to conflict, curiosity is the silver bullet. And this was taught from a man that I had on my vision board to meet, Daryl Davis. Now, if you don't know Daryl Davis, he is the black man who has influenced over 200 KKK members to give up their robes, their hoods, to pass in their ideologies of hate and, and to step into something, to leave even their communities behind, to question everything that they've ever learned about hating others who look different from them. Daryl Davis was someone whose TED Talk I just kind of stumbled across. It's got over 11 million views, um, one of the most watched TED Talks of all time. And I was doing a keynote speech down in Maryland, and I, it was 15 minutes from where he lives. And I just sent him a flyer of, a, of an email. I'm like, hey, man, I'm going to be in your neighborhood. I'm, you're an idol of mine. Would you be interested in doing a podcast? And we had just gotten started. And he was like, sure, where and when? And he came, like I rented out this co-working facility. I mean, he was super super generous guy. He comes with this huge duffel bag of like Klansman robes, Klansman hoods, swastika flags. I mean, just all the paraphernalia that the men who he'd influenced to leave, he brought all of it. And I'd never been close to, you know, hate wardrobe and apparel like this before. And we sat down for three hours and we did, you know, a three-part episode series, episodes 15, 16, and 17. I'll link all these episodes in the show notes. And the thing that I learned from him, Bri, that was so powerful was like, if you're talking about the opposite ends of the spectrum, like the extremes, Daryl Davis, black guy, sitting across the table from someone who has sworn to hate black men, and in some cases have killed, taken the lives of black men. And he has sat down and through leading with curiosity, his his leading question in life is, how can you hate me if you don't even know me? His curiosity has allowed that other person who once was hateful to sit down and to stay at the table, to not throw fists, and to continue coming back to the table where over the course of time, Daryl's curiosity of how did you get here to this place of hatred has allowed that person to relax and then to chip away at their certainty. This curiosity, this is the thing that I learned from him, this curiosity started to make them feel seen, heard, understood, respected, appreciated. Daryl became an absolute student of clan history. He became smarter than 99.9% of the Klansmen and their history and ideology and their structure and their legislature. And through that, they felt respected by him, which then caused them to question their hatred of him. And eventually they were able, in many cases, 
200 people, including the Grand Wizard of Maryland, gave up the robe and the hood. And so I look at that as being such a strong and important lesson about curiosity, especially when we live in a time where we've been polarized politically, you know, like what's your vaccination status? Are you red? Are you blue? Whatever other argument, cancel culture. And this man has sat down across from those who hate him and he's won them over through his pure persistence and unrelenting state of curiosity. Something I noticed when I looked through the list of lessons from our last 250 episodes is that the ones that really stuck out to me have created a new standard in my life. Boom. That standard of curiosity has helped me. And that, that those all three of those episodes are on my list, Dom. And we didn't go through our list before recording this. So this is, we knew we, we would probably have some overlap and this is definitely one of them. I'm curious, Dominic, in your life, how has that been used? How has this lesson been used? How has it come up for you? I mean, when you run spaces of men's groups and you take men into really emotional situations, you're going to experience conflict. As you ask men to confront some of these demons in their lives and you push them further into the places they don't want to go, they can get angry. They can get upset. Their emotions can be directed towards you. And when I say you, I mean me in many cases. And I can find myself in these conflicting situations where I could easily make it personal. I could easily make it about me. I could easily want to defend myself. And instead of leading with that, I just lead with curiosity. Wow, that was an eruption I didn't expect to have happen. Wow, that's resistance I didn't expect for us to encounter. Wow, that's a withdrawal. Wow, oh, you're, you're leaving the mastermind or you want to leave the mastermind. You're ejecting. You don't want to come to this thing. You don't want to do this work. I'm just curious. I'm curious. I'm curious. I'm curious. And through that curiosity, most men have never been met with that. They're used to having someone else come back with their conflict, with their anger, with their defense, or try to shame them. And instead, when they're met with my curiosity, they trust me and they stick around and they go deeper. So that, that, that has been one of the most powerful ways that I've used that standard. I've noticed that curiosity is truly, a, a, not as a tactic, but it's truly allowed the conversation to go further. And usually there's a lesson for me in that. When somebody tells me something, whether it's you know, in that mastermind stuff or relationship stuff, and I get triggered, that's my, my new standard kicks in for like, wait a second, like, can I get curious around this? Yes. Like what might be there? What's the 1% truth is something I ask myself often. And it allows the conversation to continue because I can feel so fast that my defenses go up and I'm ready to go to battle. It happens often. We all do. What's on your list, bud? All right. Next one is around dick health. Oh, it took us three of these to get to the dick. Okay. That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of our favorite topics is so we, we had Dr. Amy Killen on, we had Dr. Dr. Jay on, and all talking about the different behaviors and activities in life that we can do to keep our, our dick healthy. And the quote that I remember from Dr. Amy Killen is that your dick health is like the canary in the coal mine. Yes. If it's not working right, then there's probably something else going on. And so I've, I've looked at that. I've changed some of my behaviors. I don't use mouthwash that kills, kills the bacteria in my mouth anymore because that's not good. I've looked at every time, every time I eat a cookie and I know that that sugar is going to plaque up my arteries and therefore my dick health is going to go down. Not that I don't do it. Still rock the cookies here and there. But I know the impact that it could have over a period of time. So I, I think there's a lot of there are a lot of gems in that conversation uh, with both of those doctors. But dick health has been something that, you know, I'm 41 now. Yeah. I got I to gotta worry. I'm not, I'm not 18. I got to worry about these things now. Yeah. There was a period of time in your life where you had to worry about like your dick just getting hard at the most inopportune moments. And then now it's like the question is like, is it going to be ready in those opportune moments? And That's right. One of the reasons why we, we even started having those conversations around dick health was because I was going through some changes like two or three years ago where I was noticing like I wasn't waking up with morning wood. I didn't feel a sensitivity. And, and, and so when I started going through that canary and coal mine conversation and I looked at my diet, I looked at my sleep, I looked at the mouthwash I was using. When I started to get more educated around nitric oxide, that molecule that's a vasodilator that causes blood flow. When I started to learn all those things, hell, dude, I'm, I'm sitting here drinking beet juice powder, right? And beet juice powder is a superfood that produces nitric oxide that creates circulation in your body. 
for those extremities, like your fingertips, your, your toes, and your dick. You were so upset when you took that strip, that nitrous oxide, not nitrous oxide, nitric oxide, and it came up like zero. Right. You were really upset by that. Yeah, because you came up, you went like off the charts, and then I came up zero, and I'm like, I'm going to fix this. And it's funny, I was just thinking about this the other day, like, I don't worry about my dick health at all anymore. I still do all the things, you know? I don't eat as much sugar. I'm doing like beet juice powder, things that are high in nitric oxide. I'm breathing through my nose instead of my mouth, reducing inflammation, these kinds of things. And I'm strong like bull, man. It's become natural now, right? Like all these all these changes that you put in over a period of a year and a half are, are just lifestyle now. Exactly. And when I wake up in the morning, Bri, I'm walking to the toilet like Steve Carell at the beginning of 40-year-old virgin. You have a, a hard dick. That's what I'm trying to say. Got it. Good. Good stuff, man. Okay. All right. My next one is... So for anyone who's listened to our show, they know the irony of the fact that we run a podcast for men and our number one most downloaded episode of all time is a man's guide to the menstrual cycle. Oh, yeah. With the incredible women from the Red School, Alexandra Pope and Shawnee Hugo Wurlitzer. Alexandra came back on to do a follow-up episode called A Man's Guide to uh, to Menopause. And my lesson learned from that is learning how to speak the language of the menstrual cycle is a superpower. Learning to speak the language of the menstrual cycle is a superpower. And when I ended up in partnership, you know, last year, I was, it was a short partnership I was in for six or seven months. We ended up reading the book that the Red School authored, right? That is called The Wild Power. And it gives you like these four different seasons of the woman's menstrual cycle, winter, spring, summer, fall, how her energy changes, how her hormones changes, how to communicate with her, what she may need from you as the man. And when my partner and I read that, she was blown away because there were a lot of, a lot that was in that book that she didn't even understand about her own tendencies, about her own cycles of why she would feel creative and alive and sexually vibrant at certain parts of her cycle. And then also like really introverted and snappy at other parts of her cycle. And she felt like an energy dip, didn't want to hang out with anybody. And this book was just kind of like a reveal for her on, oh my God, like these invisible forces have now become visible. I can now learn to align with them and communicate them to you, a man who's well-versed in this, who brought this to my life. And she was like, you know, infinitely grateful for that. So for me, learning how to speak the language of the menstrual cycle and to honor that and its power has allowed me to become a much more trustworthy man in the eyes of those who have periods. And bringing that sort of intelligence to our partners, I know I've had, I've had a couple of partners now that are like, same thing. I didn't know this and thank you. Well, you're actually, you're interested in understanding this. And I've heard the definition of love is like never ending the cycle of learning about someone. Mm. Like the things that we love, we want to learn more about, whether that's sports or lifting or supplementation or morning routines or our partners. Mm. And so understanding this thing that is not biologically um, natural to us it is a sign of like, I'm here for you. I'm here to learn about you. And it is a superpower because I felt in, in several relationships, like I was just, I was standing at the shoreline, just getting crushed by wave after wave after wave, trying to do my thing, trying to stay steady, not really understanding it, getting upset because it was always changing. And I feel like after that episode, somebody gave me a surfboard and taught me how to surf. And I said, oh, now I get it. Now I know how to show up differently in these moments. And also, how boring would it be if it was always the same? Right, right. That's our job. We can do that. The masculine can do that. We can be here. We can be steadfast. Like, how freaking boring could that be? Right. So that was a great episode. Yeah, man. What you just hit on was something really important is as guys, like one of the things that we often value is our stability. Not every guy. Like there's a lot of guys who, who shift and change quite a bit, but there seems to be something uh, inherently masculine around stability. You know, like haircuts don't change all that often. The wardrobes don't change all that often. You don't move all that often. Like, you know, there's like a stability there. But to spice up the life, to move from grayscale into color, like change, right? Texture. And women have a built-in natural cycle of like the hormones change every season of that four season cycle. And if we continue to treat that the way that we've been indoctrinated, which is, oh, she's PMSing. Oh, she's crazy. Oh, she's, you know, that is the absolute disservice versus like the welcoming that 
and learning how to dance with that because there's times where she may be really introspective and introverted and there's beauty in that. There's times where she wants to go out and dance and rage and have spontaneous sex. There's beauty in that. And you get to, like you said, pull out your surfboard and ride that wave. Yeah. And there's so many lessons. If we're, if we're able to listen to it instead of, instead of shoving it off as, oh, PMS, let me just stay away. Now get closer here, like understand. And you, I can promise, I can promise you will learn something about yourself. All right, man. Number five, we're up to you. All right. So another one, I'm, I'm going to keep this theme here. Mad Moon broke down five, what was it? Five ways that men lose credibility with women. And I felt prior to that podcast, I felt like I was doing pretty good. I'm a pretty credible, credible guy. The only problem with that theory was I nailed all five of those things that she talked about. <laughs> you felt personally attacked. And I didn't know I was doing them. Uh -huh. Right. Uh -huh. Right. And so I love this podcast because there's so many lessons and tactics. Like really, like God, we, we love the tools. We love the like, tell me what to do and let me nail it. Right. And there was a lot of that in this podcast from the way we touch, from being on time, which has been a lifelong struggle. And now I know what I'm trading when I promise something, when I commit to something and I don't do it, including being on time. Mm -hmm. It's no longer an okay excuse to just say, ah, that's me. That's how I, that's how I operate. I'm always late. Like, nope, because then I'm crushing my credibility for anything else I say, whether it's pertaining to being on time or not. So I love that podcast. Big shout out to, to Madeline Moon and the work that, that she's done on her podcast and, and on ours. Okay. So this is one of the ones where we overlapped because Mad Moon, uh, she was brilliant on that day. She's always brilliant. If you don't follow her on Instagram, I'm going to actually link her in the show notes. She does TikTok and Instagram. She's blowing up because she creates these spiritual comedy videos. And she takes what's typically like divine and precious. And she just turns into this like slapstick humor where you actually get to learn these concepts around like masculine, feminine polarity, how to keep sex going in the bedroom, how to communicate in these like everyday situations. She's, she's brilliant and she's just beautiful in her humor and, and in, every, in every respect. So I'm going to hone in on the one thing that really stood out to me in that episode, which was the lack of integrity and in knowing what you can and cannot handle. I would even add an addendum to it is the lack of integrity in knowing and communicating what you can and cannot handle. Here's a really relevant example of that. One of the biggest complaints that Madeline has and that the women in her communities have around the men in their lives is that the man is constantly overwhelmed by work, never has enough time, has so many responsibilities on his shoulders. Everything is so important. Everything is so stressful. And he doesn't have time to dedicate or energy to dedicate to the relationship, right? He comes home, he's exhausted, and then, you know, yells at her for wanting to spend quality time because he's like, don't you realize how much work I have on my shoulders, how much responsibility, or can't create time because work is, you know, 12 hours a day, six days a week. What she really forced me to look at, because I've been that guy many times in my life, is like, you know, if I was really honest with myself around what I can handle and what I can't handle, then I would have much more free time than I do. And I would also prioritize this relationship, which I say is really important to me, which clearly is getting the scraps of my energy and my attention. And what's really driving this overwhelm or this busy schedule or all this pressure on my shoulders is because there's some sort of inadequacy deep down inside that I am trying to mask or trying to resolve by taking on the world. And that's a lack of integrity of being honest with myself, of knowing what I really can and cannot handle. And she really helped to expose that. So that one we both agree on and we're double dipping that one in the show notes. Overlap. There we go. Well, my friend, it's back to you now. All right. This one is a, was a more recent episode and it was just you and I. So we didn't have a guest on this one. It was the episode about your sister. Ah. Uh, what was the title of that one, Dom? Four Spiritual Lessons for My Special Needs Sister. One of those four lessons was that your sister is epic at receiving. Yeah. She shows like immediate and effusive gratitude for anything that, that she's given or that's brought to her. And that is something that I didn't even know that I struggled with in my life. 
it's one of those I know we have a great episode when afterwards when I listen to it or even after recording it, it stays in my head for a couple of weeks at least. And it's something I continually reflect on. Like I know something's there when that happens. And that one lesson, there was all four lessons were great. But that lesson for me was like, wow, how can I do better in receiving? This is something you and I talked about in Colorado, Dom. One of the benefits that I didn't expect when I started to receive, I wanted to give more. Yes. I wanted to be more generous. And I am like just taking some baby steps around that right now. I've always had a feeling of, you know, is it because I don't have enough abundance in my life that I, I don't feel like I'm more gracious with my either my time or my finances? Like, what is it? Like, like what, what, what's that block? And who knew that the block was, I, I just wasn't very good at receiving. Yeah. It was so many times that somebody would ask me if they could do something for me, if I wanted something. I said, no, 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 no I got it. I'm self-sufficient. I can lone wolf this thing. No problem. I got it. And as soon as I started saying yes to people, it was amazing what happened in those relationships and in myself. Yeah, man. I mean, it's, it's amazing how crappy we are at receiving. I mean, think about if like, when you pay someone a compliment, like, and they don't receive it, you know, I was guilty of this. I remember I was out having drinks with a friend, this is like five years ago. And he goes, man, I really love that shirt that you're wearing. Instead of just being like, thanks, dude. That's awesome. I was like, oh yeah, I bought this thing. It was like 25 bucks. It was kind of on the clearance rack. And he just looked at me just like, okay, like that was a weird response to that, right? <laughs> and then when, when, you know, when you tell Mary, who's wearing these like pink sparkly Uggs boots, Mary, I love your boots. Thank you. To take it a step further, when I give her gifts, you know, I come home with a bag of her favorite Starbucks coffee or I buy her Shania Twain tickets for her birthday, which she loved. She lights up like, you know, the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. And the beauty of that is she lets it all the way in. And she feels no obligation. There's no ledger. There's no debt to respond and to give back. That's like the biggest thing, right? And I know one of my barriers to receiving is like, well, now that someone's received, like given this to me, I have to give it back. Yeah, we have to, we have to, we have to get to even, right? We always got to be even. I don't want to owe anybody anything. Exactly. And, and what I learned from Mary was if you allow in and you receive and then express your gratitude, that is, you have paid the debt. Because it feels so good when my sister is like overwhelmed with joy because of this excitement of going to see Shania Twain in Vegas, I'm done. I don't need anything else from her. That enthusiasm is more than repaid whatever expenditure I've put out. I have to admit something here on the podcast. I remember last year for my birthday. So I just I just had my birthday on Friday. Friday the 13th birthday, finally. I've been waiting <laughs> yeah. for this for years. Uh, but last year, I remember getting cards, a couple of gifts. And I didn't even say thank you in some cases. Mm. I just had it and I felt I'm like, uh, it felt the reason being is it felt like pressure. It felt like now that I have a gift, now that I have a card, like I know I should say thank you. That's the right thing to do. That's how I was raised. But it was always like I didn't want to make that phone call or I didn't want to write that note or write that email to say thank you because it felt like pressure of like somehow we're not even now. Yes. And that's an awful, awful, awful behavior. And part of that started to drive an identity for me. It was like, I'm not a grateful person. Like I'm entitled. Ooh, yeah. That was starting to come up in me. And this year I made sure that for people that sent me something, a card, a video, uh, a gift, I was like, this is amazing. Like, thank you. Like, they, like I, here's how I'm going to use this. Even if it was cookies and I asked for no cookies, but I got some cookies. But it doesn't matter. And it, it was so much more fun. It was so much more fun to receive like that. I'm glad you received like that. And, and, and one other, I'm going to put an addendum on that because for me, like, especially with the cards, for me, I still do feel a lot of like, like that would feel like an obligation to me to thank every person for the card. Marie Kondo offers up something beautiful about this in uh, the Life Changing Magic Tidying Up. She goes, when I receive a greeting card, I hold it up to my heart and she's just like, thank you. I let it all the way in and then I throw it in the trash because I'm not keeping it, right? Like she's like, I don't want the clutter. Like its purpose has been served. I felt it. I felt the person who wrote it. I let it hit my body and now it's gone. You know, it's, it's not, it's not going to clog up my space anymore. So I've actually enjoyed element. I don't hold every card up to my heart, but like I, you know, I, I get the emotion and then I say, thank you in my own way. And then I toss it. I kind of wish you held this to your heart. <laughs> some, some of them I do. Okay. What's next, Dom? What do you got? Number eight for me is inner work doesn't have to be so damn serious. 
And I learned this one from Frank King. Oh, nice one. Yes. I mean, you talk about an episode. Frank King is the comedian who talked about depression and suicide. Real talk about depression and suicide. It's episode number 218. All these episodes that we're talking about, we're going to link in the show notes. And Frank King came on the show and had this like beautifully uncomfortable comedic conversation about the realities of suicide, about the realities of depression. And he said, it's okay for us to be able to laugh about this stuff because for me, it's cathartic. And I remember one of the stories that he said, he was like, listen, just so you can understand about like how my mind works. He goes, if my car breaks down, I have three options and they're all legitimate. I get the car fixed. I buy a new car or I kill myself. Like that third option is always on the table because then the problem goes away. This problem and the, all the other problems go on. And when he was talking like that, he was just like, guys, it's okay to laugh, you know, with me, right? For him, that's a space that he consents. And he does these stand-up comedies all, all over the country, all over the world. And if you watch him on YouTube, he's very uncomfortably hilarious. And I don't know, Bri, if we had more laughs on any podcast of the 250 plus than that one with him, it reminded me that yes, this inner work stuff is serious business, but it doesn't always have to be so damn serious. Elizabeth Gilbert is another beautiful example of like, she can take you to the deepest, darkest places because she knows how to weave in laughter, weave in comedy, weave in these like moments of tension relief. And I know that like, I struggle with that. I can get too precious sometimes in this stuff. And if we want to stick around for the long term, we need to have our senses of humor. And you've even said this, a lot of, a lot of men who enter in the personal development workspace say, before I entered personal development, I was having a lot of laughs. I was joking. Now I get to this place, everyone's triggered, everyone's so sensitive, everyone's... So, and like, when do I get the humor back? Frank King was one of those guys who was a real shot across the forehead like, hey, the humor's right here. Let's have some laughs because this is what, this is going to be what allows us to endure the harder stuff. And he also gave us permission to laugh because there were a few jokes that he threw in there that Ooh. you and I looked at each other like, uh. Dude, yeah. <laughs> He's like, it's okay, boys. You can go. <laughs> that was also the podcast where you and I said the least amount of words because we didn't have to. <laughs> That's right. You, just, you hit the play button on Frank King and, and here we he, go. He goes. All right, last one for me here. This, I would be remiss if I didn't bring this one up. I would hate for you to be remiss. That'd be awful. I'm not totally sure what remiss even feels like, but I don't want to be there. So this little nugget of information has changed not only my relationship with Becca, but has changed a lot of relationships around us. And this podcast was with Alexa Martinez. Yes. Episode 86. Where we talked about all kinds of things, but the thing that stuck out most for me was this idea of a relationship board meeting. And a relationship board meeting for Beck and I is four questions that we sit down every Sunday morning. We grab our coffee and we have a dedicated, usually about an hour, to go through these four questions where it's all about being heard. It's not about back and forth banter. But we ask the four questions, which is, where did I show up great this week? Where could have I shown up better? Where do you need support? And what's on your schedule? Huh. Right. Just those four questions. We sit down and we talk about those. I go through the four. She goes through the four. And then there's some discussion usually afterwards. But that has been such a reset for our relationship. And there's variations on the questions. Those are the four questions that work really well for us and are consistently part of that relationship board meeting. But it has become ritualistic. Just like my morning and nighttime routine, if we don't do it a given week, we can feel it. There's some baggage there that gets a little bit heavier every single week that we don't do that. And it's been a beautiful practice that we've been able to share with her parents, with other people around us. And they've picked up their own version of the relationship board meeting. That's a beautiful one, man. So that's a weekly meeting. How long does that typically take? Usually an hour, sometimes shorter, sometimes longer, depending on what's going on. And when did you say, like what day and what time do you typically do it? We found that Sunday mornings work great for us. Yeah, that's beautiful, man. I love that. I'm going to link the Alexa episode in the show notes. My last one, Bri, is not from a particular episode itself, but it's from having run a podcast with you over this last two and a half years. And the big learning that I took from that is creating is the ultimate form of learning. And you and I talk about a lot on the show, 
are you consuming to create? Are you just consuming indiscriminately? We just did an episode, a solo episode recently about you're consuming way too much content, right? Like, you know, here's five questions to upgrade the amount of content and the type of content that you're consuming. And what I found is that to a certain point, consuming content can educate you, but for what? Where you really start to pick up on how much you've learned, it's when you have to distill what you've learned and then to articulate that in a few sentences, to be able to see the light bulb go off in someone else's eyes. That's different than a light bulb going off in your own eyes. You'll learn that there's gaps in your knowledge. You and I had to figure out what our voice was on the show. You know, like our first six episodes that we recorded, we trashed. We never even brought them to light because they were so bad. And we knew that that was going to be a part of the process, but we had to learn what was our cadence, what was our tempo. We had to learn who our audience was, what they wanted to hear about. I've had to learn how to take criticism at a really deep level. There was a time where, remember those, those three ratings on the podcast that came back to back to back where it was like, Brian's really funny. Dominic's an arrogant fuck. You know, like we should hear more about from Brian. Dominic talks too much in the podcast. Like learning how to take that criticism and then to just like not allow it to affect my well-being, being able to find the essence of what it is that you're trying to communicate and get that across in as few words as possible. Following the creative energy of things to know like what's worth creating and just what's not. You know, I could go on and on and on, but for people who are listening to podcasts and you're listening to this one, if you're hearing these words right now, the big trap I see people fall into is we just become these consumption machines and we never do anything with that info. And so the ultimate form of learning and taking all of the ungodly amount of hours, the hundreds of hours that you've invested just this year in gobbling up media, podcasts, music, television, news, what are you going to do with that? Create something with it because it's the ultimate form of learning. And check your energy while you're doing it. Oftentimes, when it depends on the, on the content that I'm consuming. If it feels intentional, if there's, a, if there's some sort of reason or purpose behind it, that can be life-giving, but it's nothing like creating. There's other times where I'm consuming and it is just mindless. And sometimes that's okay as long as I'm in the zone of wanting to be mindless. But again, there's nothing like that energy of, of creating, which takes more energy, which is harder in some cases. We can't just create, create, create either. Uh, there's a balance here. But I do know that that, energy, that creation energy feels wholesale different than when I'm consuming anything. Very well said, man. So we'll put an exclamation point on that. To wrap this up, I would love to hear from our listeners, like what are some of the biggest lessons that you have learned? And you know, one of the ways that you can let us know that if you haven't already, I mean, this is, this is always an ask. You can, you can always email us directly. You can go to dominicq.com. You go to doinnerwork.com and, and write to us directly. But the ask is going to be to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And let us know, let other listeners know what was one of the biggest lessons that you've learned. And if you know the name of the episode, point people to that because that's what allows new listeners to come in and say, ha, huh, this show's worth listening to. So whatever way that you feel called to let us know what lessons that you've learned that have stood out to you over these 250 episodes, or if you've just jumped on board within the last few weeks, we still want to hear from you as well. That's one great way to let us know. Brother, it's been 250 plus episodes. The journey has been amazing. Thanks for leading the bus on this thing. And I am looking forward to what the next 250 look like. Dude, thanks for getting on this bus with me. To do this alone, I mean, I've done a lot of solo episodes alone. Like that opens up a part of my creative expression, but it's always better with you, man. So thanks for being there and all these evolutions. And I can't wait to see, like you said, where the next 250 episodes bring us. Hey, Brian and I wanted to thank you for the ratings and reviews that you leave us. We read every single one of them, and they're so helpful in helping us to understand what resonates with you and helps us determine which topics that we use in the future. So if you found this episode to be of particular value to you, will you please leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts so that we know that this is the kind of topic you want to hear more about? And it also helps other prospective listeners to figure out where they can dive in first. Thank you. Thank you.